I will start by thanking everyone for attending this conference, for the organizing committee to invite me. And I have a special thanks to Françoise. She's an incredible scientific collaborator and we have made this amazing study looking at the effect of fasting on the gut microbiome, the first one of this kind. And it was amazing to mix our knowledge, our knowledge about fasting, my knowledge about gut microbiome, and I will present you these exclusive results, which have not been published yet, but which are submitted to a scientific journal right now. So I am working at uh, King's College London, mostly on the toxicity of pesticides. I try to understand the toxicity of pesticides on the gut microbiome, and this is only recently, as I told you, that I met Francoise, and we started to work on the effect of fasting on the gut microbiome. So during my presentation, I will start by showing you some general aspects on the gut microbiome, because this is a new science, there is still a lot we have to learn, and I want to show you that this is still baby steps for now. We are still at the beginning of understanding the gut microbiome, and I want to show you that the gut microbiome is very variable and that it is difficult for now to integrate it in diagnosis for patients. I will show you some examples about how the lifestyle can affect the human gut microbiome daily, Taking, into, taking examples from animals and humans which are behaving similarly in most of the cases. I will detail some of my work on pesticides, but briefly because this is not the most important for this conference. And then I will talk about gut microbiome and fasting, showing you that most of the science nowadays is interested about what we eat. There is this new field about personalized nutrition, but if everyone is interested about personalized feeding, we are the first one to think about personalized fasting. First of all, you have to understand that the body, the human body, is a very complex ecosystem. This picture is a piece of art, but uh, it reflects how we are made, we are an ecosystem symbiotic between microbes and our body. There are around 38 trillions bacteria in the human body. We generally have the number that there are 10 times more bacteria than cells, but it depends on many different factors because I will show you that the gut microbiome is very dynamic. Our gut is, large, is like a large incubator. We are feeding this incubator, the bacteria are changing, adapting, and then this microbiome is flushed out when we go to the toilet, so you have to understand that it is very dynamic. This microbiome has been linked to profound changes on human health in the last decade. This is a very new science that we have found that Changes in the gut microbiota are linked to cardiovascular disease, liver disease, metabolic disease like diabetes and obesity, some inflammatory disease, and even mood disorders because we know that the microbiome is able to influence our brain and our mood. But this microbiome is very dynamic, and we still don't know what is a normal gut microbiome. We generally hear that there is a balance between two large classes of bacteria, Firmicutes and Bacteroides, and that an imbalance can have some pathological effect, but there would be people with 90% of one bacteria, other people with only 10%, and these people will be perfectly healthy. So the question is complex, and more studies will be necessary to understand what is a normal and healthy gut microbiome. When we think about the gut microbiome, we are thinking mostly about bacteria, but actually, bacteria are not the major components. There are 
100 viruses for one bacteria in the gut microbiome. And there is a constant war between viruses and bacteria. These, bac these viruses, mostly bacteriophages, they are always attacking bacteria. And we know that these bacteria predators can also shape the gut microbiome. In some diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, there are some patients where the disease is activated because they have low level of this bacteria called Fecalibacterium prozini. But this bacteria alone is not sufficient to trigger the disease or protect from the disease. In fact, the disease becomes active when this bacteria is infected by some viruses. I will show you now how the gut microbiome can be characterized because it's amazing to see the changes in technology, how DNA sequencing has changed our society when 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we needed large machines as big as a fridge in large sequencing centers to study the human genome. The first sequencing of one genome cost was one billion dollars. And now we have some really small device to analyze DNA in a real-time manner. And I've got one of it here that I will be able to show you if you want later. This is as big as a phone, but this is a DNA sequencer. And we can sequence DNA with this machine very quickly. There are some applications which have been published and now we know that this machine can detect infection and characterize a microbiome in six hours. So we can imagine that this machine can be used in the near future daily for monitoring health, for, for understanding if a treatment will be good or bad for a patient. This is how this machine is working. In fact, this small machine can be plugged with a small chip which contains holes and the DNA fragments will go through these holes as you can see here. And in real time, you will have the sequence of DNA coming, A, T, G, C, in real time. And so you can understand the composition of a microbiome or the sequence of a genome in real time. And this is becoming incredibly cheap. I will show you now how the gut microbiome can affect your lifestyle and how can your lifestyle affect the gut microbiome because this is a dialogue, this is always two ways. I'm working in the field of toxicology so I had to put this slide which is showing that there are a lot of biological process happening in the gut microbiome because there's 100 times more genes in these bacteria than in our human body. More genes, it means that it can do more chemical reactions and metabolize more products. And we suspect now that the capacity for metabolism of the gut microbiome exceeds the metabolism of the liver. It can digest food, industrial compounds like pollutants, it can digest pharmaceuticals. And this microbiome is changing every day on a daily scale. I told you it's large, like a large incubator which is fed and flushed out. It's very dynamic. And when you eat and change your diet from a plant-based diet to a meat-based diet, the function of the microbiome will change within one day. Even unsuspected factors like traveling can affect your gut microbiome. I can tell you that uh, here this is the gut microbiome of one person. You have different bacteria and you can see that this person has been traveling abroad during this period and you can bet that coming here, your microbiome has changed because you are in another place. I will now take some examples from wildlife because this is always very interesting to understand human. 
And I will start by showing you the example of this small animal, this wood rat, which only lives because of its gut microbiome. If you go in the US in the Rocky Mountain and take some of these animals, they will die if they are eating this plant. But if you are going 200 kilometers away, these animals will eat only this type of plant because this is the only source of energy available and their gut microbiome has, lear has, has learned how to get used to these toxins. I will show you now some interesting properties about the transmission of the gut microbiome because some species can only survive because their gut microbiome need to acquire some new functions to digest the plants they eat. This is the case of young koalas. They have to consume the feces of their parents to obtain some bacteria which are able to digest eucalyptus leaves. The microbiome is also transmitted in humans, also not in the same way. But this is very important to understand that we have now in our society a global phenomenon of missing microbes. It's because healthy people have generally a healthy microbiome because it has a great diversity. And in our societies, due to our diets, the diversity of the microbiome is very poor, which is likely to give us some disease. It has been shown in mice, when mice are fed high fat diets, they have metabolic problems and they can transmit these problems to their pups because they will transmit the microbiome which is not able to, uh, to detoxify, in a way, the effect of this high fat diet. High fat diet. It also happens in humans. Humans can adapt their environment because they can take up genes from the environment to digest some compounds. This is the case in Japanese population. They can digest this, the algae made making sushi because they have this gut bacteria which have incorporated a gene coming from a bacteria living in the sea. So you can see that the microbiome is very dynamic and we can acquire new function because our microbiome will change and help us. It's also associated to the survival of some species because the microbiome has also a huge hormone metabolism capacity and some animal species need their microbiome to regulate their hormones and reproduce. It has been found recently that uh, we were not able to breed this type of animal in zoo because they were lacking some gut bacteria that were needed to reproduce in the wild. More close to medicine, we know that the microbiome affects the activity of many drugs. Some are very common like aspirin and in fact, there was a recent study showing that on a panel of 271 common drugs, two-thirds of them were metabolized by gut bacteria. This can have dramatic effect for patients because this is also the case for chemotherapeutic drugs. It has been found that uh, chemotherapeutic drugs can be inactivated by the gut microbiome, so you will have some patients responding to a chemotherapy. Some others will not because of their gut microbiome. Their gut microbiome can also help to fight the tumor, so it's not always detrimental. It's sometimes a symbiosis. The gut microbiome can also intoxicate us. This was a public health scandal when uh, I don't remember when it was, but there was these batches of uh, milk from China which were contaminated by this molecule, melamine. And this molecule is only toxic when it's metabolized by the gut microbiome. 
the gut microbiota also affects mood. This is shown in animals. These animals, when they are depleted of their gut microbiota, they become less emotional. And if you take the microbiome from a normal animal and transfer it to another bird, you can transfer the mood status. Has not been shown in humans yet, but we know that the gut microbiome has profound effect on mood because in some cases for autistic patients, it has been shown that there's an amelioration of uh, mood and symptoms after fecal transplants. These fecal transplants are an interesting and promising way to cure some diseases which are associated to gut microbiome dysbiosis. But it should be done carefully because a gut microbiome transplant can also bring some bacteria which are pathogenic. And there was a case two weeks or two months ago where two people died after a fecal transplant because it was not well regulated. This was also a recent study in kids these scientists from Japan have discovered that the gut microbes of a young baby, 2.5 months old, can be used to predict his temperament trait at six months age. This was one of the earliest discovery about the link between gut microbiome and uh, human metabolism. This study was actually done in King's College by some of my colleagues, and they showed that if they took the gut microbiome from obese individuals, they were able to make mice obese. And if the microbiome from a lean twin was taken, the mice were, were fine. It's not sure how it can be translated to humans, because I've seen that there was a presentation at a conference in Boston two months ago where they revealed the first results of a clinical trial where patients were treated for obesity by fecal transplants. And even if they didn't release a publication yet, what they said is that it didn't work as expected. This is also a new study showing that uh, Athletes have been found to have different gut bacteria. Marathon runners have been found to have one species of bacteria, and if this species of bacteria is transferred into mice, the mice will be able to run longer because this bacteria is involved in lactate metabolism. There is actually a controversy around this study right now because it was sponsored by a startup trying to sell probiotics, so there's doubt about their protocol, but it's still uh, an interesting finding. I will show you briefly how pesticides can affect the gut microbiome and talk about my research briefly, so it will be a bit out of this topic, but I hope it will be interesting for you. Because the gut microbiome can be considered as an ecosystem. We all have a different ecosystem. Some people will have a forest ecosystem, some people will have a desert, tundra, or any type of ecosystem. And this ecosystem can also make you able to receive some bacteria and adapt them to your metabolism. What I mean is that there has been studies and practice of giving probiotics to patients since decades now. And the most recent studies show that even in most cases, administration of probiotics can be uh, efficient. In some patients, it will not be efficient and it can even promote inflammation because for some people, the bacteria Lactobacillus, for instance, will not be received well by their ecosystem, and their gut ecosystem will fight because this is a stranger bacteria. This is considered as an infection sometimes. I show you this 
example of having the gut microbiome considered like a garden because I'm working on pesticides and there is nothing like Roundup to eliminate weeds. <laughs> so this is my main interest. I started working on pesticides by looking at uh, pesticides made of glyphosate, <laughs> which have been found to be more toxic than we expected. And it was more toxic because we discovered that there was other toxic compounds which, was not, which were not regulated in pesticide based on glyphosate. <laughs> These glyphosate-based herbicides, they are the most used pesticides on the planet and their use continues to increase. This is a map of the US. I don't have a map for Europe, but the trend is very similar. We wondered if this pesticide had an effect on human health and to test their effect, we bought some Roundup formulation in a shop because this is what people are using. And we found that this formulation of pesticide is never evaluated as such. There is always only one ingredient which is tested alone to make the regulation and other ingredients which are added to allow the pesticide activity are not regulated. And what we found when we compared the toxicity of commercial formulation of Roundup to glyphosate alone is that some formulations are 1,000 times more toxic than glyphosate. This is what you can show, see here. I took this example because this is intestinal cells. And so you can imagine that uh, if the complete formulations are not evaluated and we think that uh, glyphosate alone is 1,000 times less toxic than it is really in the intestine, there is a problem in the regulation. This has resulted in banning one of these glyphosate co-formulant, our research, but there's others, and they choose, the, there was tens of co-formulants which were toxic, they only banned one, so it makes their life easy, but there's still a lot of progress to do. Right now, I'm studying the effect of glyphosate on the gut microbiome because pesticides are never tested on gut microbiome. This is very new, and this is not part of regulatory guidelines. And this is even more worrying because glyphosate has been commercialized on the basis that it didn't have any target in humans, but it had one target in plants, which was only found in plants. But this was not true because this target is also found in our gut. And there was no study to show whether glyphosate can affect our gut bacteria. So this is what I'm doing right now. I don't have all the results, so I'm not presenting any details, but uh, I can tell you that my first analysis showed that there is an effect and that glyphosate behaves in the gut microbiome as it behaves in plants. Not sure if it will cause pathology. It's still more analysis down the line, but for now, this is a first result which will be important because it means that we have to regulate pesticides for their effect on the gut microbiome. I wanted also to show you this piece of research that I did recently about some pollutants acting as obesogens. This is a new effect that was not discovered, that was discovered only recently. Here you can see some mice. One was exposed to a drug, which is also found as a pollutant. And you can see that this mouse has gained a lot of weight. And we've recently found that we, some pesticides can also act as obesogens. They can increase lipid accumulation in adipocytes. Here you can see that the hormone dexamethasone, which is a positive control that we use, 
can increase the lipid accumulation here. The green dots are the lipids, and that we have the same effect if we treat by this pesticide. And what's very interesting about this pesticide, it is that this pesticide is advocated to replace glyphosate. So there's a lot of controversy on glyphosate. We know that it's more toxic than previously expected, especially on farmers' population for occupational exposure. But we still don't know if glyphosate is toxic at low level present in foodstuff. So I don't know how we should regulate glyphosate because this is a complex question. But what is sure is that we should look beyond the toxicity of glyphosate and look if glyphosate is banned, what will replace glyphosate? And potentially, it is pesticides which are more toxic. Back to the gut microbiome and fasting now. I will illustrate what I was talking earlier a bit, that uh, gut microbiome is now used as a tool for personalized nutrition. There are recent studies showing that if you look at the gut microbiome of one person, you will be able to predict how this person will react by after the ingestion of some food. Recently, it has been shown that if you look at one person and how she replied to the administration of food, this will not be translatable to another person. Everyone is unique. And this is why now we have this uh, new wave of personalized diets. But something is missing here because this is the dominant paradigm in personalized nutrition. We only think about nutrition. We only think about feeding and that we show that the response to food can be used to optimize health. This is very interesting because this is very promising for the future. But something important is missed, and here I don't need to tell you what it is because you will not be surprised that the response to fasting can also be used to optimize health. Because alternation of feeding and fasting is part of human and animal physiology. This is what is usually done in the wild, and that fasting is supposed to happen on a daily basis. We talked a lot about that, so I will not go into the details. And I will now talk about the studies that we have performed using the patients at the clinic. This study was performed with some authors, some authors who are in this room, Francisca, Yvon, and Francoise. This study is actually already available as a preprint because this is an important finding for public health. So we didn't want to have to wait one year before it's accessible to uh, the community. I will show you first some interesting results which were done by Yvon quite a long time ago now. In 2001, there was already some studies showing that fasting can have profound effects on the intestine. And we know that fasting can provoke some apoptosis in the intestine to regenerate the mucosa. But after some prolongation of fasting, apoptosis is decreasing and the intestine is getting ready for refeeding. But we didn't know what happen to the gut microbiome when we are fasting. This is why we have analyzed the effect of a 10-day Boehringer fasting on the gut microbiota of 15 healthy men. Some of these guinea pigs are in the room. You will maybe recognize your profile. <laughs> First of all, we confirmed that there was a metabolic switch from carbohydrate to fatty acids and ketones that you can see here. We had a 10-day fasting period, which was followed by a period of refeeding. And what was also unique in this experiment is that we added a time point at three months. So here you can see, for instance, that cholesterol 
as rather high level at the beginning of the fasting. It's decreasing at the end of the fasting. This is the time point two. The time point three is the refeeding, so it's still decreased during the period of refeeding. And you can see that after three months, most parameters are returning to normal, but there is still a trend of uh, decrease which may be revealed as significant if we were having more large, larger populations. We have sequenced fecal DNA fragments from one gene in fecal samples to analyze this gut microbiome. This gene is called 16S, and it has very specific conserved regions which are specific of species of bacteria. And by sequencing the DNA from the gut micro microbiome, we can identify the bacteria from these genes. This was done, done using this machine, but in the future, this could be done because the technology is evolving so rapidly that this is now becoming available for, uh, for clinics and uh, hospitals. We obtained a large number of DNA fragments which allowed us to classify more than 1,600 variants. One is representative of one species and now then we use databases to identify what are these DNA fragments. In total, using the most recent database, we were able to identify 213 species in this cohort of 15 individuals. This is the gut microbiome for each individual. This is here the ID number for each individual, one to 15, because we have 15 individuals. Here, this is the phase, one, two, three, four, for pre-feeding, pre-fasting, after fasting, after refeeding, and after three months. You can see here that the reaction to fasting is personalized because some individuals have a large increase in some proteobacteria which when they are fasting, but not some individuals. So it means that the gut microbiome could be, in principle, in the future, potentially used for predicting the outcome of fasting. This is some research which are ongoing, and uh, this will be very promising for the future. Some individuals are of more healthy profiles than others, even if it's really difficult to say what is a normal gut microbiome. We generally assume that an increase in proteobacteria is, it is considered as abnormal, normally, but here we are not talking about the normal, as usual, metabolism. This is the metabolism during fasting. So what we considered as abnormal during fasting Maybe uh, what we considered as abnormal when we are not fasting may be normal during fasting. There's still a lot of research to do. I had a beer with individual 12 yesterday, and I can see that uh, this is one of the best profile. <laughs> we found that some specific bacteria changed in the gut microbiome during fasting, and that uh, there was an interesting profile that bacteria which are fed by the nutrients we absorb, by our food, they were decreasing, they were disappearing, but bacteria which are using our molecule, disquamate cells or some glycans, everything which is in our body, have their level increased. One very important finding here is that although there is a very strong effect during the fasting, which is also seen at the refeeding time point, we can see that the microbiome is back to normal after three months, which is showing that uh, the, it's 
confirming the safety of Boehringer fasting because there could be concerns that when you are depleting your gut microbiome, you will not recover. But actually, the gut microbiome is quite resilient, and when it is challenged, it comes back to its normal state quite often. It can be improved if uh, people are improving their diet because this is, as I said, you improve what you absorb, you will improve your gut microbiome because it's constantly changing when you are eating. We have seen that there was a trend of an increase in some bacteria which are considered as beneficial, like this Coprococcus octatus, which is considered as beneficial because it is able to produce some short-chain fatty acids which have beneficial effects. And I always like to compare the, the findings to wildlife and this is very interesting because the gut microbiota response to fasting in humans was very similar to what you observe uh, in animals hibernating like in squirrels. When animals are hibernating and when humans are fasting, you have the similar decrease in bacteria using plant-based compound with an increase in bacteria using host compound, our molecules, as a source of energy. We found that the changes in the gut microbiome could be linked to energy metabolism because there was changes in glucose level which can be predicted by some changes in bacteria. Here, we have a low power because it's a relatively small cohort for such an analysis. But uh, there are some experiments in mice which show that uh, when mice are depleted from their gut microbiome, glucose levels are dropping which means that there is a control of glucose level by the gut microbiome. This also implies that shutting down the harvest of energy by the gut microbiome can influence weight loss. I will explain that a bit more because one of the properties of the gut microbiome which is sometimes ignored is that when we have 2,000 calories available every day, 200 or 300 of these calories are coming from the gut microbiome. And they are coming from the gut microbiome because we are eating plants which are not directly digestible, but they are digested by our gut bacteria. So these zero calorie fiber that we absorb, they can become 200 calories fiber because the gut microbiota will digest and produce some energy. This is what happens in obese individuals in some cases. They have a higher capacity of producing their energy with, the gut micro with their gut microbiome. I found also these results very interesting because it's always good to look at findings in light of evolution, and I think that we, all are, we have here very interesting results which can give us some indication that maybe the gut microbiome was also a driver of human evolution. Because if you think about it, when you have population of animals or humans living in the wild, hunting or harvesting fruits. If some individuals can acquire some bacteria helping them to digest and produce some energy, this is an evolutionary advantage. And so we can think that the gut microbiome is a driver of human evol evolution. And maybe the reaction to fasting is also important for human evolution. We don't know yet exactly if it's the case, but uh, the fact that the mechanism of response to fasting in the gut microbiome can be found similar between squirrels and uh, humans may be showing that there is an interesting point here. We found that 
the composition of the gut microbiome was changed, but also its activity, because there were some changes in the level of short-chain fatty acids, which are beneficial compounds, and these short-chain fatty acids are found to increase after the three months period, so after three months, after three months after fasting. It's difficult to know if it's directly the property of the gut microbiome which makes this result because in Buhringer fasting, people are all, all also acquiring healthy habits, they are changing their lifestyle. And what we see here is potentially an effect of the lifestyle change in these individuals. We also monitored intestinal, intestinal permeability and in inflammatory status, and we found that, interestingly, there was no change in inflammation at the end of the fasting, but when food was reintroduced, there was an inflammation because the postprandial absorption of nutrients was reactivated, and so the food wa coming was again considered as a foreign body by the immune system. In perspective, I think this study is opening a lot of doors. There's a lot we can do from now. We can wonder what about fungi and viruses, because I told you that bacteria is maybe the most important. We don't know yet, but it's the tip of the iceberg, and we can wonder if there is a change in the activity of fungi and viruses. We show that the response to fasting is maybe not unique for the gut microbiome and that maybe some profile can help us to have some personalized fasting intervention because the gut microbiome is now, you can see that it's an integral part, it's reacting very quickly, the metabolism is changing, and so strategies to take care of your gut microbiome during fasting could also be promising strategies for improving patient health. You already know that, but this is probably the most important conclusion because everyone is always looking at personalized feeding, but uh, we should also look at personalized fasting. And I didn't know how long I would take for this talk, but I think I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>